leadership, organization, which we deem as values, policies, and climate that really sets the context of you know where people work, then workforce and technology. So those are the four dimensions. And there are, as we you know, touched on, there are many different nuances to culture that are added to that, like communication or managing. Welcome back, everyone, to the Geeks, Geezers, and Googleization Show, the home of Googleization Nation, where we talk with HR and business thought leaders about the crazy shift going on all around us and explore the disruptive convergence of technology, business, and people. Here are your hosts, Ira Wolf and Jason Cochran. Hey, and welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Geek Skeezers Googleization, a show from the People Forward Network. I'm Jason Cochran, hosting solo today while Ira is away on the speaking circuit. Thank you for being part of Googleization Nation. If you think this is just another podcast, think again, my friends. We are the leading show on the future of work, confronting business leaders and people today. Our goal is to bring you ways to reimagine tomorrow as we explore the convergence of business, technology, and people. Because of you, we are a top 1% podcast globally in popularity. We're also ranked as a top 100 business management podcast, and we're also in the top 100 in the thought leader podcast category. So thank you for being loyal listeners. This episode of Geek Skeezers Googleization is sponsored by our partner, Y Institute, your personal and professional GPS for a meaningful life and purpose-filled career. You'll hear more about the Y Operating System and Y Institute later on in the show. Well, folks, today we are going to learn how to measure the value of organizational culture in the digital age. As you're going to hear in just a minute with our perfect labor storm segment, we're still kind of living in the dark ages when it comes to accurately measuring and reporting on human capital, particularly culture. But before we, we get into those specifics, let me start by asking you a question as we kick off today's show. What's your culture worth? In other words, if someone offered to buy your company today, could you put an actual dollar valuation on your culture? Now, don't feel bad if your answer is no, because that's the answer for virtually every organization in this space. Yes, most organizations are doing an improved job at measuring employee sentiment, but for most organizations, this is as deep as the analysis and synthesis goes when we think about valuation of human capital. But don't just take my word for it. Listen to these data on this subject in today's perfect labor storm segment. According to Ocean Tomo, 90% of business value for the S&P 500 companies are intangible assets. If you're wondering what that means, that means this includes things such as intellectual property, brand, inventions, software, patents, and customer data and relationships, just to name a few. In other words, the 90% of the value of companies are in things that are a direct derivative of your people in your organization. In fact, over the past 35 years now, the value of intangible assets has more than tripled, and it's showing no signs of stopping as businesses rely less and less on physical assets such as land, buildings, and inventory. And then listen to this too. In August of 2020, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC as you often hear it, issued new rules for public companies to disclose numbers on human capital, including things around culture. Since that time, the top three areas that are increasingly being measured and reported out, according to Gibson Dunn, are number one, talent attraction and retention, number two, employee compensation, and number three, DEI. You'll notice that culture didn't crack the top three there. We still have a really long way to go with measuring and reporting culture in a meaningful way because in that same report, and this just came out in January of 2023 from Gibson Dunn, it showed that only 23% of companies reported information related to practices and initiatives to build and maintain their culture. And of those only 23% of companies that are reporting things related to the culture, the most common thing they were reporting was simply deploying employee engagement surveys. So that's our perfect labor storm segment. And as you just heard, 
you can see that we're barely scratching the surface with measuring culture effectively and understanding how it drives value for the people and the organization. And if we aren't measuring and capturing everything we should be with culture, it truly makes it hard to understand what it's worth and how you can actually improve it each year. Well, fortunately, today's guest, Tom Bradbury, has expertise in bringing these types of things to light and providing visibility and insights into this holy grail in the business world. So let's go ahead and bring him on so that we can get started together on this topic of how do we measure culture and what is its actual value? Tom, welcome to Geek Skeezers Googleization. Thanks for having me, Jason. It's great to be back. I was on the show a couple of years ago with Ira. Um, You're absolutely half right. years ago. Yeah. So it's, You're uh, a veteran. it's great to be back. I'm a grizzled well, veteran. Grizzled veteran. And not like much has changed in the last couple of years, right? No. Probably no, from the last time you're on. Yeah. yeah Wait, exactly. let's start. Let's start here then. Even though it's been, you've been on before, yep. let's just get to know you a little bit more in terms of who you are and why you're passionate about this topic of culture, how we measure it, and how we are able to understand whether or not it's delivering value for an organization. How did you get started down this road? Well, for about 20 years, I owned a workplace transformation company that focused on the technology component of workplace transformation and in part of the real estate ecosystem, the workplace. And through our work directly, as well as through a you know kind of informal partnership with uh, my friends over at Cushman and Wakefield. I know you had Brian on the, on the show last week. He's fabulous. His show was fabulous. I got to participate in a lot of workplace strategy engagements. And over and over and over, Jason, I would see little twisted differences of the same version of stuff within these businesses that as someone who owned his own business, right, and would find certain things every once in a while, stumble across certain things that didn't align with my values or my goals or what I wanted my people to, you know, my, my, my colleagues and employees, you know, how to think as a team or individually things just didn't align. And I knew that working at some of these large organizations, CEOs would be frustrated and maybe, dare I say, embarrassed with some of the realities of what it was like as, you know, to exist as an employee. What was the reality of working within this business as the CEO would be out on his or her soapbox saying, this is who we are, this is where we're going, this is how we're going to get there. And there was a lot of imbalances between that the stated goals and the 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 reality. So uh, it put me on a path to say, how do I help senior most leadership stay connected or to stay engaged in and around culture? And I saw it would you know kind of be maybe over delegated to the HR domain, not because they can't handle it, but because we need leadership involved. So what do we need to do, and how do we need to do it? to get CEOs and boards of directors invested in the culture for all the reasons you mentioned in your, in your introduction to culture and, and what people are measuring and reporting in and around and what that intangible value is to a business. I love it. Have you ever watched Undercover Boss? I have, yes. When you were just describing that, you know, I just was thinking about Undercover Boss, and it's been a while since I watched an episode, or at least it had been. And then it was a Friday night. There was nothing else to watch a few weeks ago. And so I flipped it on. I'm like, well, the only thing that looks interesting is Undercover Boss. And it was the CEO of Smoothie King was right. on. And so he's at these different franchise locations where he's disguised doing work with the people that are making the smoothies. And so he asked the manager at this one location, I think it was the, a Nashville, Tennessee location. And he said, hey, how do you feel about the, the new brand? you know, of smoothies that we came out with that are more lean, that are more, you know, healthy for people. And the manager just looked at him and said, I hate it. And the CEO goes, well, why? And the manager said, because the customers hate it. Nobody's buying it. And instead of the CEO just saying, hey, all of you franchisees have to now sell this new blend. It's like there was no research done to figure out whether or not the customers actually wanted this. And so obviously, as the CEO is hearing this disguised, he went back and was like, we made a major mistake here. You know, we miscalculated in terms of being able to roll something out to customers where we didn't properly test the market. We didn't get people on board in terms of how to sell it and things like that. I'm going on and on. But as you were just talking, 
about sometimes understanding their culture and even taking missteps with customers, sometimes it's like we can get in, if we're an executive leader, a little bit over our skis in terms of trying to do things too quickly before taking a more of a, a, a planning approach of what is the type of stuff that we should be looking at first and considering before taking an action. And I say all that to tee up this next question for you, which is, what the heck is culture? I mean, if you if you listen out there, there's a lot of definitions of what culture is. And so I'm curious, whenever you're working with companies and you're trying to help them understand culture and how to think strategically and at a high level about how to measure it, what is your definition of culture with them? Again, keep in mind, my North Star is that CEO, right? Or senior leadership. So how do I distill it to the most important essence, right? So I've worked on this and borrowed from different people and considered many different things, but simply put, shared values and appropriate behavior. That's how I see culture and think of culture. And I think there are many nuances and certain people might feel strongly about certain nuances being baked into the core of culture, but at its core, I believe it to be shared values and appropriate behavior. Well, I appreciate how succinct that is, because as we often know in business, we can sometimes overcomplicate things. Yeah. And even though we're, we're talking about something today about how do we take something that's a little bit more nebulous or abstract, and how do we make it more concrete in terms of measuring culture and what's the actual value of it? I think that what you just shared is a good reminder of in order for us to do anything effectively with people, there has to be clarity. And the way that you get to clarity is through simplicity, where there's that shared understanding. And I love that you brought in that it's shared values, but it's also the appropriate behavior that follows that. So I've got to ask the natural follow-up question. If that's your definition, and that's what you use with leaders and companies, then what are the next steps after that? After there's this shared understanding of what the culture is, What's the next thing they need to do to wrap their heads around measuring it and understanding it? So maybe it's not what the culture is. It's what they think the culture is or what they want the culture to be, right? But culture is, as you know, a very holistic topic, right? With many different inputs. So we use a model that has four dimensions to, to understand and simplify the approach to bringing structure to culture to start to measure it, right? And it's, so once we get the data, collect data, and we're able to better define or baseline initially, baseline culture to understand where there are needs for improvements or evolution or clarity that CEOs and CHROs need to be aligned around in order to go address any areas of risk, as we say, organizational risk. And with that, Tom, I'm often engaged in conversations whenever I use a model called the four principles of connection to measure a lot of the drivers in terms of how people need to be connected in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions I often get from executives is, how do we compare to other people in, in the industry? I'm curious in your work, is that something where you do try to provide like some benchmarks in terms of here's how you stack up with other businesses that are in this industry? Or do you stay away from that and make it more of a, this is about you compared to you? How are you now compared to how were you two, three, four, five, six months ago? Which is yep. more the approach that you take or that you recommend leaders take in their organizations? Well, we want to think about, especially nowadays, like during and coming out of the pandemic, right? You have a lot of the workforce, the individual saying, what's right for me? Do I want to go to an office? Where do I want to live? Do I want to be hybrid, fully remote? What's right for me? And, you know, I think what we have to do as business leaders and people who run their own businesses, large businesses, middle market, small, is you have to understand what's right for us. What's right for us as a business, you know, based on who our customers are, what kind of products and services are we delivering? And, and what, what do we want? What do we think our culture needs to be in order to be effect, effective given all those inputs, right? And realities. And you really have to figure out what's right for us. And part of it might be you want to differentiate yourself from another competitor. So there's a reality from being in a certain space, banking or tech or some sort of consulting 
but you also want to consider what's our little twist that we want to add to our culture, right? That, that helps separate us or differentiate us from, from our competitors. So to answer your question, I think that's where all businesses should be starting. And while I see some incremental change in thinking that way, still by and large, most businesses are not. They're, you know, whether it be, do we go into the office? Do we don't go in, Do we not go into the office? This is more of like, you know, putting your fingering up, up, finger up in the air and saying, you know, which way is the wind blowing, right? And and kind of following that rather than saying what's right for us. You know, I was shocked when doing some research for the show today, seeing the report on human capital disclosures that we're still only sitting at around 23% of companies that are measuring anything around culture because it, it feels like we hear so much about this now. Maybe it's just because of the circles that we run in the type of, of of company that we tend to keep, but that still the vast majority, three quarters of companies still aren't measuring culture in a meaningful way. And the, even the quarter of companies that are, that really all they're doing is just simply an engagement survey, maybe once or twice a year, and that's the extent of it. So where I want to go with this, this next piece that I want to ask you is you mentioned mm -hmm. and referenced that when you work with the executives, you're helping them understand that there's four dimensions or four aspects of culture that they need to understand within your model. Can you help walk us through what those are and explain what those are? Sure. The four dimensions that we base our model on are leadership, and they're prioritized in this order, by the way. Leadership, organization, which we deem as values, policies, and climate that really sets the context of you know where people work then workforce and technology. So those are the four dimensions. And there are, as we you know, touched on, there are many different nuances to culture that are added to that, like communication or managing. And sometimes communication, as a great example, might layer across multiple dimensions, right? There's communication within technology. There's communication from leadership that's important. So we, what we love about our model and is the fact that we can run any type of data through it. Meaning, if you want to understand how, how your culture is set for innovation, we build a survey, which is how we're doing a lot of data collection, right? Around innovation, specific to innovation. So take each one of those four dimensions. Leadership's going to have an impact on dimension. The context, which is the values, policies, and, and climate. like. That's going to have an impact on whether you're innovative. Your workforce, how are they trained? How are they prepared? How are they reviewed? That's all, you know, if you're thinking of innovation, that has to be calibrated, right? And then there's technology. Do you have the tools to be innovative, right? So it's tough to be, you know, if, if you're working off of outdated technology or something one or two, you know, uh, versions back, can you be innovative? Right. So, and you know, that, that's how we look at being able to drive just about anything that's important to the what's right for us. Right. We want to be collaborative. We want to be innovative. We want to grow our ability in and around data analytics. There's a lot of different things that we can run through our model and then bring some structure to culture. Now, we want to be careful and not have you give away all the trade secrets, the secret recipe that right. you have. But but just to kind of give our listeners a sense of when, when you're measuring these four dimensions, if they were to get a report, you're walking through results with them. What do those data kind of look like? Is it on like a five point scale or what's the, the meaning or insights that come from the types of things you're measuring around those four dimensions? Well, each one of those dimensions is going to perform on its own, right? And then you're going to get a profile based on the performance of each one of those dimensions. And you're really going to get a better understanding with the data behind it, where you need to take targeted action, right? And, and again, this is strictly on measuring the culture end, right? And I guess we'll talk about the, the financial impact of culture as well and, and how we drive that. Absolutely. But before we get into the finance piece, you brought up technology, as one of those four dimensions that you look at. And obviously, feels like we've been kind of in the blender since November when ChatGPT in particular 
went public and everybody got to start tinkering with it. And feels like we've been in the AI blender here, you know, going on five months now where there's tremendous, like literally every single day you're seeing new solutions coming to the market with AI built into it, particularly language model stuff around GPT-4. Where do you see the future headed when it comes to measuring culture and then being able to equate it to value being delivered for the organization and for people? Where's this headed, you think? Well, I think we're going to be like when you look at culture, it's very holistic, right? And we're going to have to look for for different types of things like employee engagement, like digital experience, like financial, you know, data. And we're going to have to figure out how we're tracking behaviors and sentiment through data and using AI to identify the matches between certain types of data with certain types of sentiment, right? And and so that that's where I really think it's going. You know, specific to chat GPT, I think there's a lot to learn. I know everyone's rushing, you know, to say we leverage chat GPT and they're and they're using it in a much more sophisticated search layer than it's been than than we've had in the past, like integrated with different offering services and products. So that's really where it's starting. And then, you know, at the same time, we're trying to understand, you know, what can we use like other than survey data, right? To to learn about culture. And I know there are a lot of people who talk about or a lot of solutions that talk about, you know, kind of listening, employee listening, right? And that teeters, like the real version of that kind of teeters on, you know, privacy issues, right? At the same time, you can use what, what, you know, a lot of those employee listening solutions are more about using AI to identify keywords in survey responses that provide written, written, you know, like expansion on a certain answer, right? And they're using that for listening. So it's going to be inter- very, very interesting to see where all this stuff kind of comes together and and supports, you know, informing leaders around the culture and the impact it's having on the business. You know, a few weeks ago, as you're describing that, it takes me back to the Bill Gates open letter that he had about AI is here. And what does he think it means for us now? What does it mean for us, you know, 5, 10, 15 years in the future? One of the parts that really stood out to me was when he started talking about AI agents and that part of this eventually is going to be like, it won't just be artificial intelligence in a screen that is generative intelligence or general intelligence, but that it may actually have a body at the table. Like eventually it's it's probably going to be in a robot and it's going to be in meetings that you're having as a team where it's also contributing ideas that it has for innovation And it's going to have all the analytics in real time, basically in its brain, where it's going to be able to deliver those those types of insights. Now, I know a lot of people are like, that sounds like science fiction, but it probably is coming. I can't give you a time frame, but who would have thought we already would be here at this point, five months into AI and be seeing the types of solutions out there that are already being used with it. Where I'm going with with that, Tom, that I want to ask you is... If that is the future where we are going to have humans working in symbiosis with robots that may have bodies that are actually at the table that are contributing thoughts and ideas as well, where do you see that influencing culture or how we measure culture? Yeah, I mean, I understand where you're going with that. My brain goes maybe a step before that, maybe a step and a half, which is this idea that you know this chat gpt like becoming more available to the public and into you know and its influence and integration with like microsoft and copilot etc cetera, etc cetera, right really offers a glimpse of the power and how it's used in a lot of ways i think of the first step of this culture is and you know i know especially in and around workplace conversations elon musk is in the most popular person, right? In 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 how he entered the you know Twitter ownership, but 
I bring him up because of his, I don't know if pleas, but his recommendations that we really look at and understand AI and some form of governance around it before it grows into things, not, not before so it stops going in the direction that you just brought it up, but that we understand its impact on humanity and things like work and life in general. So I, I feel like that's going to be a big push and pull is how it seeps further and further into our lives, specifically in this conversation, work, and what we do about it from a governance perspective. Do we just let it go, right? Or do we kind of put some rails on it, right? And then understand the impact. Even baseball, right? Using statistics and you had the shift. They started to see the impact that it was having on the game and the results. And this year they changed the rules around the shift, right? To limit it. And that that might not be a one for one, but the shift was part of the data analytics and the progress pro- progression of the game and how you manage the game. But then they saw what it was doing and they used some governance to bring it back. So that's where I really see the conversation as both interesting and extremely important in 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 the short term. You're muted. Yeah, you go. Yeah, and you brought up baseball, Tom. So we got to go there because I'm I'm a baseball guy. Gotcha. And one of the other major changes, too, is the pitch clock, mm-hmm. right? That now they've instituted this to try and speed up the game. And you're already seeing a lot of changes in terms of the, the total amount of time that it's taking for a game to complete. It's gone from like over three hours. Now it's down to like around two and a half hours. So it's saving like 30 to 40 minutes per game. When you're working with organizations at Broad Gauge and you're giving them clarity on what their culture is and how to measure it, what are the biggest benefits that they report that they're seeing in that work as they're working on their culture? Yeah. First off, I love the example of the pitch clock, right? As it pertains to senior leaders who have thought a certain way and and kind of approach things a certain way, right? And then when the data comes in and you take measurement and you show them what type of organizational risk and where that organizational risk lies within their business and you propose new ideas, i.e. like the shot clock, I mean, excuse me, the pitch clock in, in baseball, right? And how it can impact them. And the data and understanding their culture in more tangible terms really positions them to listen differently and think about it differently. And and so that's what we rely on is the data. What's come in and what is it showing us and how do we pivot, whether we're tweaking some internal programs or we need something a little bit deeper and we make a recommendation to hire, you know, an expert in whether it be diversity or innovation to really dig deeper in certain areas of the business to make change. But even before that, how we tee it up, Jason, is by showing them the financial impact of their current culture, whether it's their human capital return on investment, which is the tracking of the efficiency of every dollar invested in the workforce and what they're getting in return, or it's helping them put a dollar value to their turnover or attrition and help them kind of flip that on, on its head to say, this is waste. The amount of energy that comes from dealing with attrition and filling in seats and the loss of productivity, et cetera, et cetera, is taking a toll directly on the bottom line. Meaning that if you limit that waste, that those the, the savings go back to the bottom line. And that gets the attention of CEOs, CFOs, and boards of directors and CHROs to say, now we're better positioned to think about how and why we make investments. So if I can go to someone and say, if you keep 10 more people than you did last year, you can put two and a half million dollars back to your bottom line based on these ISO supported calculations, right? Now, all of a sudden a CEO is thinking, wow, I can put up to two and a half million. How much would I then invest to get that back to the bottom line? So we trigger the conversation that way and then follow up with the measurement of culture 
and then make recommendations that are aligned. And that's how we're gaining alignment with C-suite leaders. Perfect. And we're going to take a quick two minute break here to hear from our sponsors. But before we do, just as a comment to what you just shared there, Tom, it's alarming sometimes how often organizations don't know how much turnover is costing them financially. It's even like when all they're the tracking them, it. Even okay. when tracking it. Exactly. Yeah. Like that there's not really a firm understanding of when a separation happens, what are all the expenses and costs incurred and how long does it take to recoup those before you're back in the positive side again for that particular position or that particular person that's been replaced. But on the front end, you know, it seems like things are always very good in terms of new revenue generation and things like that. But definitely on the other side, when we're trying to measure those things related to attrition, definitely some some room for improvement, like you said. But we're going to take a quick two minute break. And when we come back from the break, Tom, what I want to get into before we get into the hopes and fears and the lightning round segments, just to kind of put a bow on on what we've been talking about here, I'd love if you could just share a few examples of some insights that have been gleaned from this work around the four dimensions and the type of decisions that that helped executives make to improve the culture or improve the valuation of the company and how maybe they were equating it to Got financial it. dollars of, of how it made you know improvement for them. So stick with us. We'll be right back after this short message from our sponsors. We'll be back with Tom Bradbury. Hang in there. For most of us, change is freaking terrifying. And unfortunately, there's no app to adapt. That might change in the not so distant future, but for now, we're on our own. That means we can either accept our default future or reimagine our tomorrow. For those of you who choose default, good luck. Just remember, there's no pause button for change. You can't turn back the clock. And there's no get-out-of-jail-free card in this age of perpetual uncertainty. Like it or not, change will happen all around us. And that change is not becoming just more disruptive and frequent, but volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous, or VUCA. Fortunately, you can make change work for you and turn it into your personal and competitive advantage. Reimagine your future to one in which you're living with purpose, you're happy, and you're growing, thriving, and flourishing. If you're ready to rewrite your next life chapter and regain control of your destiny in this never normal world, your journey starts here. Contact the leader in adaptability and making change work for you, your team, and your organization. Ira S. Wolf, adaptability.expert. There's a certain kind of coach who believes what we believe, who leads people to greatness, who gets people unstuck, who unlocks all of your passion. A coach who helps people discover what drives them to tap into their superpowers. That knowing your why is the first step to untap potential, to focus, to breakthroughs. A coach who's looking for a better way. Are you that coach? And welcome back, everybody, to Geek Skeezers Googleization. We are thrilled to be joined by Tom Bradbury, founder of broad gauge and we're having a conversation around how do we measure culture in a way that actually shows valuation not only for people who work there but also for the organization and i got to share something real quick tom before we get into what i asked you before the break we have a comment from a listener a friend of ours stephanie hicks over at our partners at people forward network and this is what she shared that the culture they've created together as a team is worth more than a new opportunity with more money So thank you for sharing that, Steph. And it is a great point. And I know we often hear it, but I think when you hear people who actually experience it, right, they just don't read about it in a book or read about it on on an actual feed, but they're actually working somewhere that lives that out where they do emphasize culture and they're backing it up with action and shared behaviors around those values that you see statements like that where people are like, Another group could come by and offer me more money, but guess what? I ain't budging. And so with that, I think that's a good segue. Before you get to that segue, and maybe this helps the segue, it's like 
just this morning, I was talking to a couple of really smart people about this very subject, right? And, you know, what kind of we started to talk about, you know, you go to the Super Bowl, you go to a ball game, you go to something, and people will come back and say, oh, $20 beer, right? But the $20 beer doesn't prevent them from going back to the ball game or going to next year's Super Bowl. It's just something that wasn't perfect for them, right? But there's something bigger about the experience that lures them back or keeps them coming. And I think that's the same way in and around culture and working for a business, right? And that's why we prioritize things the way they are. Like too many executives sometimes take the easy or more fashionable way of buying new laptops or understanding if they like the benefits, right? Health benefits, which are important aspects of work. But most of the time, if it's a great culture, someone doesn't leave because of a new, you know, they didn't get a new laptop or the benefits aren't as good as somewhere else, right? And I know plenty of examples where people, you know, left places that had better benefits to go to somewhere, a business that had a better culture. No doubt about it. And I think we, we all, we, I think it's easy to become numb when hearing those things, but these are people's lives. And I think more people now, they really are thinking about where they're devoting their time, energy, and resources more than ever before. And that work really is more than just about money. And it is about the culture, that there is some kind of a value exchange there that happens. And so kind of segueing off that, what you just shared, and and thank you, Steph, for sharing your sentiments on that with People Forward Network, is, Tom, there's this holy grail of how do we connect then? We know culture is important. How do we connect it to, is it actually driving value? What do those conversations look like that you're having with executives? And what are they wanting to, to see? That's indicating to them, okay, what we're working on here, these four dimensions, these are the things I'm looking at where it's actually creating improvement in terms of value for our people and the organization. Yeah. So I would say kind of, you know, changing how we look at the data, the financial human capital metrics, right? Taking something and showing a CEO who used to be the CFO or, you know, has that you know, ability to, to understand financial metrics very well, like showing them how human capital ROI works, right? As an indicator, showing them how much attrition, as we talked about, how much it's costing them. And if they addressed it and made investments appropriately, how it could return money and, and boost corporate performance, like kind of, you know, like changing the paradigm a little bit to get them to think about it and look at it a little differently is a big eye opener. And then even with some of the dimensions, specifically technology, I've, I had two CEOs so far in conversations this week to say to me, wow, I never thought about technology. I never looked at it through this lens, but you're right. We don't think about it. We think about it you know, as making sure it's reliable or, or you know, working or meeting our goals and compliant. But at the same time, it's so pervasive and such an important part of our day if it's not working well, right, or not, you know, there's some user experience deficiency, what a drag it can have every day on people and have an impact on their, on, on how they feel about at work. So just taking different things and, and posing it a little bit differently in those ways gets senior leadership's attention. And I think the, the, the back half of your question are maybe some specific things that we've uncovered for for CEOs and leaders and, and kind of showed them how they could think about it differently. So a few that come to mind is, you know, in many cases, employees don't feel real comfortable being honest on surveys, right? And in, in some sectors, whether it be smaller businesses or in healthcare, there, there's like this overriding concern, right? About being identified as someone who wasn't positive. And, you know, we had one client where the data came back and really showed, we, we kind of triangulated it between our culture data and measurement. Their, the impact attrition was having, they had a high rate of attrition in 2022. And then third was we added the ENPS score to kind of show them, you know, why you know, the data was showing and it kind of validated the fact that the data was kind of too high, right? Where people weren't 
And, you know, what does that mean? That So this happened while we were baselining the organization, right? And where we look for like more broad themes to kind of take the temperature and understand how we make recommendations to a CEO. Let's do these things and start to build confidence in what we're doing so that you can communicate what you found and you can start to demonstrate investments where people say, oh, you know, what I say, what I offer counts. They're trying to improve. So in this case, what we're doing, what we did was make the recommendation that, you know, this, the next component of survey uh, of a, uh, that we're going to measure as part of their culture, we gave them two options. And what we're saying now is let's send this out as a poll to employees. What should we measure about our culture next? Right. And let them speak and find out what's important to them and then go with it. Right. And make that a more transparent process and then help them be more comfortable in giving feedback, especially when it's critical. Right. You're going to get better input. So that, that's a big recommendation. And, and, you know, that type of observation and recommendation is, you know, is not something that's few and far between, right? We, especially if you haven't tended to culture in a while, getting people to participate in what you need from them in order to make the culture better is is huge. Another rec- uh, recommendation we made recently was after observing through our dashboard the impact culture was having through tenure, right? Where there was a specific group at this business that was typically comprised of people, you know, closer to the start of their career, right? And they thought about it in terms of like Navy SEALs training, right? They even kind of rationalized it, but they were getting hit hard with turnover in this group. And what we did was by kind of pinpointing on this department and then flipping through the tenure filter, we saw that in year two, how the perspective on culture plummeted, right? And the recommendation then goes back and says, let's lean into this. Let's make this a program where people come here for these types of reasons to build a strong foundation to their career. Let's make it more about their career than the job, right? And let's incentivize them, right? And remember, we've teed up already how much attrition is costing them. So they're willing to make investments. So now you can think about bonuses. You could think about maybe, you know, I know I had a an employee who worked at who went to get their MBA at Stern. They they got the opportunity to intern and then were offered a job. And it was stay here two or three years and we take care of your college loans. Right. So bring that into building a program where you have a class of people who who leave the program after a year and maybe you're helping them go to another business or another area. Maybe you're helping, you know, shape where they can land and stay at your organization, but you're going to get more out of them, right? A longer tenured employee. If you invest in the, the career, their career path and incentivize them to kind of go into it, knowing what to expect. And, And then a third one would be, what we see a lot in our baseline is people tend to be most comfortable like criticizing technology, right? And we'll get some real specific data about what about technology. And if we want to delve more, we'd recommend some sort of focus group or, or workshop around talking to the groups or departments that were taking issue with tech and go make some investments to you know grab some low-hanging fruit to demonstrate we heard you and look. We're investing, you know, we want to demonstrate by showing you how we're investing to make this better. There are so many excellent nuggets there that you just shared, Tom. Two that I just want to kind of focus in on as as we get ready to transition over to the hopes and fears segment. Number one is I love you shared the emphasis on after you do the initial round of measurement on culture that the executives were like, okay, next thing we're do is we're just going to take a poll on what people think is the next most important thing to consider about culture. What are the eyes and ears on the floor that are out there working with the customers that are working together? What are they seeing that we should be focusing on? Because sometimes it's easy to think you've got the best view in the ivory tower, but sometimes up in the clouds is when you have the least understanding of what's going down on the ground. 
every day. And you're and, building that trust that what they say yes. is important and you're going to act on it. Absolutely. Because it's even worse. The, the research has shown it's even worse to do a survey and not follow up by doing something than it would be to never do the survey in the first place. So if you're going to survey, you got to follow up and do stuff with people. So I love that takeaway. The other one too, I love that in your four dimensions of culture that you measure, the technology is one of those. And you talked about this, but I want to go in a little bit deeper on it. There have been mile markers that have been really important in the transformation of business and the world. And it just so happens that we've gone through two of those within a three-year time span. Any business who's still operating the way that they were in 2019 prior to COVID, good luck if you're still in business. If you're still in business in another five years, kudos to you. You got something special. But if you're, you're trying to operate the same way, as we did back in 2019 before COVID ever happened. Good luck doing that, right? We knew that there was going to be monumental waves of change that needed to happen in terms of how and when and what we're doing related to work. But the other one that just happened in November, we talked about it with artificial intelligence, and that is technology. Traditionally, I think we viewed it as something that delivers value for businesses in the sense of, does it help with efficiencies? Does it help with productivity? And now with artificial intelligence, the conversation is flipping and it's like, no, what is it doing in terms of new value creation? So not just helping us with our efficiencies and driving down expenses and costs, but what is it actually helping us in terms of innovation and going to product, going to market with new products and services as well? And I'm so glad to hear that your model is taking that into consideration as an aspect of culture, because that is an important part of the future of work is artificial intelligence and technology isn't simply going to be about reducing costs and just improving efficiencies. Yes, it's going to do that, but there's this whole other side of the coin of it's going to help with value creation for the business and moving forward and making that an incremental part of the fabric of the culture that you're building and how it's going to be interwoven with people to enhance how they feel about the work that they're doing and also drive new value in the marketplace for customers is going to be extraordinarily important. And so with that, We've, we've come up, we're already at 50 minutes in. I can't believe I told you, Tom, this is going to go fast. Love let's it. segue into, since we're talking about the future, and this is a future of work show, let's get to our popular new segment called Hopes and Fears. All right. Very simply, Tom, I'm going to ask you, what are your hopes for the future and your fears for the future? My hopes for the future is that as we continue to see the pandemic in the rearview mirror, that we start to, business leaders really like work has such a tremendous impact on so many people's lives, right? It's where they devote so many hours and so much of their time and effort and it builds pride and, and whether it's wealth or education for your kids, there are so many different things that come out of how you choose to spend your work life. So getting leaders to focus on that what's, what's right for us is such an important thing for every business. and business and the economy, whether it's through the US or globally, right? And situate it, uh, situate people and businesses to be productive and successful. And, and really, as these businesses define what's right for us, the matching that happens with the what's right for me, right? So yeah, there's a lot of different ways people can look at work now. I want to be fully remote. I want to be hybrid. I want to go to the office. Right, all of those businesses are going to present different options. So, I really like the idea that as we get away from the pandemic and the and the workplace activism maybe calms down a little bit about how everyone should be able to work wherever they want, when they, and there just starts to be an understanding of I want to be fully remote and I want to live in Idaho, but I can work for this or that type of business who has figured out the what right what's right for us. That's that's a match for what I want to be doing and where I want to be spending my life. So I hope that that pro continues to progress. And we, you know, and, and I also hope, you know, and, and I think this is a direct or indirect input to all this stuff is politically, we, we find kind of more topics to agree on, right? And that has an impact on our lives and, and working and our families, et cetera. I fears, love it. The fears I would, you know, I fear that we don't find the common ground, you know, here in the U.S. and 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 globally to agree on things and move forward. And, you know, 
people things keep staying out on the edges, which you know the edges are great for activi- activism one way or another. They're great inputs to consider, but we just need people agreeing on some stuff in the middle to help help bring us forward. And and I fear that that's going to be a steep climb for a little while and cause unrest in the economy and some, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, you know, I think we'll get through it. I love it. Absolutely. And with that, Tom, we're going to segue into the final segment, which is the lightning round segment. We're going to just send a few questions your way here to get to know you a little bit better on a personal level. So let's start with this one. How about a favorite band or a favorite song? I don't know that those are the the same thing, but favorite song, the first song that pops to mind is a song. It's a very long 10 minute plus song called Low Spark of High Heeled Boys by Traffic, which is one of my tunes that I love to just put on and, and do some work or work out or just chill mostly in the background. If you've never listened to that song, I'd, I'd recommend taking a listen. And the band, hmm, I, I'd probably go with Pearl Jam as my favorite band. I love that. That's the first we've gotten Pearl Jam. They're a bucket list band for me. I've yet to see them and concert, but I absolutely want to see them before they. I've seen them a few times. Once while I was backpacking through Europe, at that, where they opened for U2 in a soccer stadium, a football stadium, excuse me, in Italy, Verona, Italy. And uh, it was an amazing experience. And I've seen them a few times here. And uh, you should definitely check them out. Very cool. Another bucket list band for me, Smashing Pumpkins. I'm going to get to see them for the first time this summer. They're going to be at the venue that's just down nice. the street from my house. So I'm excited to see them. Sounds like you need some more Gen Xers on your show if no one's ever <laughs> mentioned uh, <laughs> Pearl Jam. Right. Yeah, they. we don't get too many Pearl Jam requests on here, but I, I absolutely love it. All right. How about this next one here? If there's one person in the history of the world mm-hmm. that you could meet or spend the day with, who would it be? Abraham Lincoln. Cool. Why? I think that he had to deal with so much conflict. So it would be amazing to understand how he navigated that and just be able to talk to him. Like he navigated with such grace, such, you know, great things he was looking to solve for, but also some difficult, you know, realities in and around what he was trying to solve for that he had to really tackle, right? Like, you know, there's you know, whatever. I don't have to go into details around that, but Abraham Lincoln to just understand what he dealt with and how he dealt with it with such grace. That's a good one. That's the first time we've had Abraham Lincoln also, but all the reasons you just gave make extraordinary sense. And of course, we talk a lot about adaptability on this show and how that's important for the future of work. Well, before there were any assessments around adaptability, I think if Abe Lincoln were to take one today, he probably would be off the charts, as you mentioned just yeah, right. with everything he had to deal with. So I love that one. Just a couple more here real quick, Tom, before we wrap up. How about a hidden talent? Do you have any hidden talents? Hidden talents? Or just something people would be shocked to 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 understand about Tom that might be surprising? I mean, I, I don't think it's anything too unique. I'm, 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 I guess one of the things is that I'm, I'm okay to fairly good at many different things, right? You know, meaning... I didn't play ice hockey for high school, but I can ice skate and I played, you know, in rec leagues into high school. Same with baseball. And I play a lot of platform tennis or paddle as we call it in this area. So I like to do many different things. And maybe where I'm deep, that's is really my awareness and knowledge around music. I like so many different things. So yeah, I, I don't have any unique answers there, but I'm pretty well-rounded person i like that so yeah so it sounds like a kind of a liberal arts degree in life a and little i did have a liberal arts sampling degree. of everything yeah. there you yes. go i dig it yeah. i dig it and last one tom biggest pet peeve what's the thing people do that just absolutely gets under your skin when they don't care about something that's important that that's obviously important to someone else in front of them right whether it's during you know a client service interaction or dealing with one of the kids, like no one can be perfect around this stuff. But when something's so obvious that something means something to them and, and is responded to in a way that kind of, you know, it's too flippant, right? you know, that, that drives me nuts. A plus you pass with flying colors, my friend. Oh, thank Great you. job thank on the you. lightning round. And so we, we want to thank you, Tom, for being with us today and delivering all these insights on how we measure culture. What's it look like in the future as we consider artificial intelligence and how does it actually connect to Valuation, dollars and cents. 
that's the direction that we're going and you helped us get there today. Uh, again, the name of the company that Tom's the founder and CEO of is Broad Gauge. You can find them at broad and then there's a hyphen gauge.io to learn more about the work they're doing around culture. And we appreciate you being with us today, Tom, and we'll definitely have you on again in the future. Thanks for having me. And I loved every minute. Awesome. See you next time, Tom. See ya. So we covered a lot, everybody. We're here at the top of the hour, but hopefully you got some really good highlights and nuggets here of what does it mean to measure culture? How do you go about doing it? How do you connect it to the dollars and cents evaluation? Highly recommend that you go check out Tom's website at broad-gauge.io to learn more because he really is stepping into the space and kind of providing the holy grail of how do we connect culture to actual dollar valuation in terms of, of what it's doing for people in the organization. We want to thank our partners and sponsors at Y Institute for this episode of Geek Skeezers Googleization. We will be back again next week with another live episode, same day and same time, Wednesday at one o'clock Eastern time. But if you haven't had a chance to like and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform, please do so. That'll keep you in the know. And it also helps us as well to make sure that we're continuing to provide you awesome content every week. But until next time, I'm Jason Cochran signing off, and we will see you next week, Googleization Nation. And so remember, don't let the shift hit your plans.